there's been a lot of talk about the, the depth of the Australian Conference here, whether Australia can sustain five teams. Um, do you think there is the depth there, or you know, do you think fours are, are more normal? Number? No, I think I think uh, you know five teams has stretched us probably a bit thin, um, and you've seen some of the effects of that. And I think we probably will see that for a couple of years. But I think as a long term investment in Australian rugby, it have to happen. You're going to start to get centres now like, across the country. You're going to feed into developing Super Rugby and rugby level players that we wouldn't have had before. So Melbourne and Perth. So we, the decision I think has been a good one, but I don't think it's fair to say that uh, we could cope with it in these early days. So there's some teething problems there. Uh, I think it'd be, it would make sense that we allow more foreign players. I think that would help. Not just, I mean, there's always the concern that they're going to take the position of the players, but I think uh, you know, as long as it's done smartly with the short window, you can actually help bring other players on by recruiting the right people. But yeah, no, I, I think I think we've punched a lot of way, considering the number of players that we've got. I don't know what people realise how few professional rugby players exist in Australia when you compare them to places like South Africa. The numbers are you know, hugely different, so yeah, you know, I think we do well. And the issue of, of head knocks and concussions is something that's come up in the last few months or last couple of years really, both here and in the US. Um, what's your view on that? Do you think we need to be doing more research into sort of you know ex players? And the effects that they've they've had. Yeah, well, you know, I think the, there's there's a lot of correlative evidence between repeated head injury and a whole bunch of mental illnesses and mental health issues. Um, and it's getting to the point where you're reaching a critical mass where you know something has to be done. It can't be ignored. The evidence is too overwhelming. Um, you know, and I think rugby does a fairly good job. I think when you compare us to you know, American football. I think the helmet in the way might make it worse. It's a false sense of security and you're actually using it as a weapon. Uh, not too many players do that in rugby. But I think, you know, there's, there's a line that you have to draw in the sand. So we're playing a contact sport, it's a combat, competitive sport. The, the players know the risks for the most part. I think if there's only so much you can do in actually mitigating the risk of head injury or repeated head knocks, uh, where, the, where the work needs to be done is on how we manage players who have that exposure not so much in trying to prevent it because ultimately there's only so much you can do. And I think I think there's the other things happening there. I know Rupert's involved in uh, making sure that players' welfare is at the forefront. Is that something you suffered in your in your career? Did you suffer, you know, a few concussions or, or some well, I had some, some, I, had some uh, yeah, I did have some head knocks. I had a concussion a few times. I'm not I wouldn't call it chronic. Um, and I don't think that that's had anything to do with any long term impact. Just because, just and that's purely anecdotal. Looking at how um, you know the, the head injuries manifested themselves in terms of doing some to be Do you think we need to potentially you know, look at having a longer break between you know, a player who suffers a concussion, whether it's more than a week, it's two weeks? It's, it's well, very obviously think, Barry Barnes had some, yeah. some issues last year with yeah. Well, I think the, the the key thing is to make sure that any interventions are evidence based. So. What does the research say? What does it suggest? Uh, where's it coming from? You know, all these types of things. And then let the experts uh, have input into designing return to play protocols rather than adding another week. You know, just that seems kind of arbitrary. It needs to be evidence based and measurable. And looking at your career, you, you retired in 2009. Do you, uh, do you miss it at all? Well, I do miss it actually. I think. Not the training. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, the day-to-day -day grind of rugby is, is tough. It's a tough job, but it's incredibly enjoyable as well. Uh, I think for me, there, there'll probably always be a, a pain of wanting to get on the field. And once you have had that exposure, sitting in the stands doesn't quite measure up. It's still very satisfying to watch the Wallabies and the Brumbies get around now and, and do as well as they are. But, you know, it's one of those things I think you always imagine some ridiculous scenario as you're going from being in the stands to being on the field again. <laughs> I think it's true of most retired players. <laughs> And what, what, what's your, I guess, greatest achievement in rugby, do you think? What, what do you look back on and think, really? Oh, I don't know. It's, um, Chris, I, yeah, I haven't really thought about it. I think uh, probably, in some ways, managing to play uh, as long as I did with, you know, I hurt my knee in 2005 and managed to play until 2009. Uh, and it was a fairly 
serious injury. So in a way, I'm quite proud of being able to hang on as long as I did. <laughs> Yeah. And is there a toughest opponent, I guess, that you, that you face? Uh, toughest opponent is probably you know, Benny Dirtha. Uh, I only played against him once in my first game over for the Brumbies and played the Blues. And, you know, it was kind of daunting. You just went onto YouTube and watched him tearing teams apart. You know, I think, I don't think people quite appreciate how good he was because uh, he played for such a short window. But I think far and away the best thing I've ever seen put on a regular. Had all the attributes, incredibly powerful, quick, skillful, just really strong. Um, and, you know, we didn't see enough of him. I was quite happy to see the back of him, actually, when he went to France. <laughs> um, you're obviously born, in, born and raised in South Africa, and you made the move uh, from the Sharks over the Brumbies. Do you ever regret, you know, having played for South Africa as a junior, do you ever regret choosing the Wolseys over the Springboks? Oh, not at all. You know, I think for me it was. It was the context of the decision wasn't just about rugby. Yeah, it's about rugby, lifestyle, long term. I haven't regretted stepping off the plane once, um, being able to be privileged enough to call Australia home. Certainly, I've wondered what direction I would have gone on if I stayed in South Africa and played for the Sharks in South Africa. Um, but that's more just a sort of an inquisitiveness rather than I've, at no stage of time, I wish I'd stayed. Or, I had to second guess the decision, and that's probably the life of a good decision when you know that it was the right one. So, you know, Australia's very much at home. It's been almost 10 years now. And you copped a lot of criticism for that decision, you know, both on and off the field, particularly when you were playing in uh, the green and gold in, in South Africa. I mean, did, did that ever affect you, any of that, you know, scrutiny? Oh, I think pressure? it did to an extent, you know. I think the, there's only so much preparation you can do to go into that sort of environment. You know, I would have been like 22 or 23, had never experienced anything like it. Kind of naive in many ways, uh, you know, in dealing with the media and I would say things that I thought were kind of uh, harmless and that would make the front page. And, you know, I think playing in South Africa and having it, you know, on, on my old sort of stomping ground with family and all the rest of it, it did, it did affect me, you know, to say that it would have been kind of dishonest and I think I, I, it's hard to quantify how much of an effect it had but certainly it did you know just trying to sleep and focus and all these types of things that uh, when that sort of pressure is brought to bear in some ways it would have been better if I just acknowledged it at the time rather than sort of be defensive about it but you know you learn these things as you go through it. Looking at someone like Clay Cooper last year do you think you know I guess a similar situation what he went through in, in New Zealand with the World Cup? Yeah a similar situation and I think it's some players handle these things better than others. I don't know whether that affected him or not. It seemed to have, um, and it would be completely understandable if it did. Uh, but I think he'll be better for it. Just like it was a really good learning experience to me, uh, for me to go through that, I think it, it'll stand him in good stead. Seasons to come, as long as he, he takes the things out of it that are, that are important and relevant to him. Uh, you know, he's, yeah, I think um, he might have a last laugh in that little jewel. <laughs> Clyde, thanks for talking to the rule. Cheers, thanks everyone.